Uh, you, you clearly are very, have been and are very moved by your brief encounters with snow leopards. Is it silly to say it, it's your favorite animal? Uh, no. Okay. It's, it's not my favorite animal. Okay. Uh, so it was silly. Uh, but, uh, uh, <laughs> I actually went to the Himalayas to study sheep and goats because I'm also very interested in the ungulates. But how can you ignore the snow leopard? It's so beautiful and so rare to see. Mm. But if you ask me favorite animal, for beauty, the, one of the greatest aesthetic experiences that you can have is seeing a tiger walking on soft paws, elegant, powerful, through golden grass. It's nothing to beat it. But how can you compare a tiger to a gorilla? Absolutely gorgeous animal and a relative. You feel like going up and giving it a hug. <laughs> really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, it was on this, uh, th- that trip in 1973 where you, and this is mentioned in the book, you, you, you expressed some interest in the Yeti. Now, we had a hint of this earlier. You clearly believed in mid-60s when you were interviewed by Desmond Morris that you, there was a sort of glimmer that you thought you might find one. What, what, what do you think now? Uh, it's very difficult to prove something doesn't exist. You have these tracks f- from back then. They're perfectly interesting tracks. But since then, nothing has been found. DNA is always something else. Human hair, horse hair. We've analyzed things. But uh, so it's gotten nowhere. Even though various expeditions in China, China had an official team looking for them. Uh, so there's no new evidence for it, which is too bad in one way, but in other way, it's lovely to think there's still a mystery creature roaming the high mountains. So the, the tracks that you spoke about in the mid-60s, with hindsight, you would say, what, were they created? Were they a sort of they're artificial, they're mad, made by man? No. Uh, they're very distinctive tracks with this toe out, nothing like a bear or whatever, and they're big, much bigger than any monkeys. They're not melted out, and uh, still don't know what it is. But if you have to have a viable population, it can't be that rare. And as far, if you're up there in the mountains, you have to eat. And a big creature has to eat a lot. Where are the droppings? DNA these days could analyze it easily if there were. So... uh, Skeptical. Ask, ask me again in 25 years. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, and, uh, I mean, in fact, Yeti is just one of um, a series of kind of mythical or semi-mythical beasts that, in fact, this sort of footprint pattern that you mm. describe has been described elsewhere in the world as well. Are they all just a sort of an invention, or do you think there might be a grain of truth in any of them? Well, you know, uh, Yeti-like creatures, there's Bigfoot and American... Northwest, uh, right there, lots of Bigfoot tracks. I've got two big plaster casts of Bigfoot tracks that have been given me, and but nobody seriously used camera traps to look for it. There, uh, the Congo, uh, Mongolia, which other countries? There are quite a few countries. Indonesia have yeah. mythical, uh, supposedly mythical large humanoid creatures. All right. Now, we've run out of clips, but we haven't run out of George, thank goodness. Uh, And at this point, I'd like to address some of the sort of current, present-day issues that are of relevance to to all of us and perhaps to this festival. Uh, You've worked for Wildlife Conservation Society for over 50 years, nearly 60 years, haven't you? Well, I started in 1956, yes, and... In 2008, I also joined Pantera, which is devoted to conservation of wild cats. Specifically wild cats? Yeah. And what projects are you doing now? What is your, what is your passion now? You've had gorillas and lions and oh, tigers. Yeah. What's, your, what's your passion at the moment? You know, one frustration is to try to do conservation, which what I enjoy doing right from the beginning is sitting around observing animals and writing what I see. Well, there's so much more urgent things. Now I spend more and more time on conservation, and conservation is politics. Uh, I don't do conservation. I go to a country and collect information, 
uh, write a report, give the facts to the government departments concerned, and then hope they will do something. I keep prodding and prodding and prodding, and most countries are very receptive, uh, especially countries where nobody pays much attention. So I've worked in Iran, worked in Tajikistan, Mongolia, uh, Myanmar, uh, Afghanistan, and so forth. And so I spent time in those countries promoting conservation with officials after getting some facts. Right now, I've been working in... Uh, I just came back from Tajikistan in the last month, uh, where I'm working on Marco Polo sheep, a huge, beautifully horned sheep, and snow leopard, and trying to get four countries to set up an international peace park. China, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And I've worked in all four countries serving it. So then it becomes politics. You discuss and what's the best way to do it and so forth. And we've had one four-country meeting. I work in uh, China on the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, last summer I surveyed snow leopard. I looked at bear damage to nomad houses. Uh, they want governments wants alleviate that uh, rather than shoot the bears. Uh, I'm staying in monasteries to train monks in wildlife monitoring. So I take out groups of monks and we discuss wildlife, we look at snow leopard scats and how to collect, collect them, keep notes and so forth, and they're very enthusiastic in going out. And this is one aspect that is ignored, both in the film community and the conservation community, for the most part, is the religious aspect. All cultures have a solid religion, or whether you're talking about Hindu religion, which is quite concerned about animals, and especially Buddhism. And uh, Buddha said, kindness to all living beings is the only true religion. And so working with monks and going to villages local people pay really attention. If you go with an official, it's just an official. If you go with a lama, people really listen what he has to say about conservation. So that approach needs to be done far more in conservation. This evening, um, George will be taking part in the Peter Scott Lecture, which is also a, a debate, really. And I think one of the issues that's going to be raised there is... <coughs> Is conservation working? Um, in fact, I think uh, there's a slightly rhetorical question. You know, uh, if it, it, why isn't it working? Because the, the plight of many of these creatures is hardly getting more secure. What do you think? I, is conservation working, or is it not? Do I answer now, or do I answer? This well, I'll tell you what. If so, just <laughs> before Harriet comes up and shuts me up, I, I, I would just say maybe you can give us a sneak preview of what you begin to think about the answer to that question. Uh, everywhere in the world, habitats are shrinking. Human population is increasing. Consumption is increasing even faster. Uh, it's been estimated we're already over using over 30% of sustainability of anything. And so, yes, the trajectory is down for the environment, Plus, we haven't even begun to think or do anything about climate change. And that's going to have a huge impact. It'll have a tremendous impact on ecosystems, which can change very rapidly, which I've seen in Alaska since the 1970s. There have been tremendous changes in forests and ice flows and so forth. And what's a species to do? A species can adapt. It can migrate or it can become extinct. What are humans going to do? They can adapt, they can migrate, or make wars, which they're likely to do for water, for food, for all sorts of things. What should filmmakers be doing? Um, should we be, as you, we talk, spoke earlier about leaving some sort of memory of beautiful places as they are, I is that enough? Should we be doing that as well as something else? Should we be 
more active, more campaigning? What, what do you think, as an outsider to our world, what should filmmakers be doing to play their part in this? Uh, filmmakers have done a tremendous job of making a certain segment of the world population aware of beautiful areas in their films. It's ignored a huge segment. Remember, about a billion people in the world have never used a telephone. Uh, so you're not reaching them. But how do you generate action? You show this beautiful film, and then you say, well, go to the website, and you find out what to do about it. Uh, I think most people, when they uh, finish seeing a film, they're going to go have a beer and not go to a website. So you need to find some way to stimulate action in people to uh, whatever you want to do, provide funds. If you show a gorgeous scene of monarch butterflies, now everybody can relate to monarch butterflies in the U.S. because you see them in your garden. They migrate to Mexico. Their little area where they spend the winter is under great threat. How do you raise money to save that area? Or this is where filmmakers can help. If I don't know how you can handle it, but it's this kind of thing that people relate to. Here's a beautiful butterfly I see in my garden. How do I save it?